they got the new PoE League announcement thingy happening in like four and a half minutes. And I'll be honest, I was going to watch that anyway. Um, so, yeah, why not? Let's do it. Uh, I missed a few things. Apparently, Diablo 4 uh, announced some, like, itemization, minion changes, but next season is, like, delayed or something. With um, With Diablo, it's always, like, I'll believe it when I see it. I feel like they could do like a long list of good things and then it'd just be like a buggy mess and there's no reason to engage with the seasonal mechanic or something and I believe it when I see it but yeah we'll we'll check out the new Diablo season of course May 14th damn that's a long time away May 14th are we even in we're not even in April that is a long season but I, like I I was saying that you know they kind of need to take some real time away from the seasons to fix up the core game. The game crashed on their live stream. I think a lot of the time, like, pre-recorded content. So it crashing is kind of, kind of really fail. Probably it was like, for sure this won't crash, and then they do it live and it crashes. How did it crash? Even? Hi, I'm Chris Wilson from Grinding nice. Gear Games. Welcome to our live stream. Okay. We have a busy lineup today with announcements for Path of Exile 2, as well as the exclusive reveal of Path of Exile Necropolis, which launches on March 29th. For the first time ever, we'll be releasing this expansion simultaneously on all platforms, PC, Mac, and console. Twitch drops are enabled on today's livestream, so Is make sure you follow the instructions in below in order to claim your Suffering Back Attachment. Suffering back today's attachment? stream will start with Path of Exile 2, where Jonathan Something will show you our latest announcements. Mark will then take you on a deep dive into the new Path of Exile Necropolis Challenge League, which launches in one week. He'll cover the league mechanics, its deep crafting system, large endgame changes, some improvements to the core Path of Exile campaign, and finally some quality of life features. We'll then show you our new supporter packs, and we'll head into a live Q&A session where Ziggy I'm D will probably gonna skip most of that Q &A. chat. After the live stream, we'll drop the full patch notes. Oh. Oh. Hey guys, it's time to chat about PoE2 again. Okay. It's only been a few months since we talked about the Mercenary, and yet even since then a huge amount has changed. When we announced the Mercenary, we also shot off a lot of the new capabilities that our engine has around animation and character control. Moving while shooting was a huge deal in that class, but there were a lot of other more subtle things going on to make it feel good too. Well, in recent times we've only been showing off new character classes, but one thing I've been really excited about is to go back and apply all the new ideas and capabilities that we have to our old classes too. Today I'd like to show off the Ranger, and I hope that you guys like what you see. Okay. What you got? I've lived in this forest all my life. Looks like Ranger. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that a Ranger must never miss. A beast will hunt you. But it is the cruelty of man I fear. There is no truly escaping the Count's justice. Your sentence is to be hanged from the neck until dead. Let your souls feed the first ones, and your bodies feed the land. After her! It is pretty hard to illustrate bow attacks that don't resemble PoE 1, though. Like, this kind of looks like PoE 1. No more fear! You won't get away this time. Knife support. Mounted arrow shots. What are we Mongolians now? Let this be a warning, Gianor. I'm coming for you next.
I mean, all right. That was all right. It's a good trailer for like the content, but like the ranger showcase, it's just really tough to showcase bow attacks. Let the hunt begin. So what's what's different here? When we started to work on the ranger, we knew we had to make a class with high agility. The dream of fast bow gameplay is legolas, so that's what we wanted to deliver. The starting point is moving while shooting a bow. Any kind of basic arrow skill can be fired while moving, with a movement penalty. This immediately gives you a lot more freedom on the battlefield. Here I'm starting each battle with a poison burst arrow to poison groups of enemies, then using a lightning arrow to arc lightning around larger packs. For even more mobility, we also have a variety of skills that involve vaulting around the battlefield too. This is Frost Escape. Using it jumps backwards and shoots a freezing arrow at the ground. Really useful if monsters close on you and you need to get away. Once you've landed, if monsters were frozen, it'd be nice to have some way to take advantage of that extra time. This is where Snipe comes in. Snipe is a skill shot that you need to charge up and release at exactly the right time. If you land the right timing, Snipe is guaranteed to produce a critical strike and does and a small right AoE timing. as well, so it's a great finisher. You can also move while shooting arrow rain skills too. This skill is Lightning Rod. It shoots an arrow into the air that sticks into the ground and does a small AoE. Once the rods are in the ground though, they attract any arcs of lightning that are nearby, causing them to explode again. Is this this like means Storm you can stack rain, up a bunch of lightning rods on the ground and bounce lightning between them, doing way more damage. I think it's exactly like Storm Rain and PoE one. Now this takes care of packs pretty well, but for bigger enemies, I'd like to have something that's going to enhance my damage output too. This skill is Stormcaller Arrow. Using it sticks an arrow into an enemy. After a short period of time, a lightning bolt comes from the sky and strikes them. This has a high chance to shock them, and shocked enemies take 30% more damage from all sources. If something big walks along, it's a good idea to throw one of these at them first to enhance your damage before following up with the other combo. Now if I really want to enhance this combo, there are a couple of things I could do using our support gem system. Skills in Path of Exile are granted by items called skill gems. Each skill gem has coloured sockets in it, and these sockets are for other items called support gems. Support gems modify your skills, and it's where a huge amount of the customization of your character comes from. First I'm going to take this multiple projectile support gem. I could add it to my lightning arrow, and it would fire multiple arrows. This would increase the number of targets I can hit, but that isn't the effect that I'm after. If I More add arrows to my lightning rod skill instead, then when I fire it, I get a nice group of rods. This means that I don't have to spend as much time setting up before I can use it with my lightning arrow combo. Pretty sure that's how storm rain works also. I might also add faster projectiles to make the lightning rods land faster too. Now next up I'm going to grab this chain support Part of the sponsorship? Gem. Chaining no, causes many sponsored. effects to repeat on new targets when you hit them. I usually just don't stream this because it's too early in the day for me. Arcs that come out of lightning arrow to strike even more targets. But I usually watch this. Along my line of lightning rods for huge amounts of damage. I, mean, I am going to play new PoE League. Now I think we can use support gems to improve Stormcaller Arrow as well. Let's start simple. I'm going to chuck less duration on here. This will cause the lightning from the sky to strike a bit faster. Next up we have a support called Shock Proliferation. This support makes it so that any enemies shocked by the skill yeah, okay. will also have the shock jumped to nearby enemies, meaning they'll take the extra damage as well. It's just a chance to proc, so it's not going to proc on every single pack, but when it does, a pack will go down ultra quick. Another useful empowering skill is Barrage. Barrage is one of the rare cooldown skills in PoE 2. It enhances whatever your next attack is to fire three times. With what we have here, I think it might be a good idea to use it with Lightning Arrow. It'll generate three times as many lightning explosions. You could also use it at just the right moment with Snipe, or any number of other skills depending on what effect you need more of right now. It's very versatile and can be used in a Bro, range of situations. Ground. Now, even as mobile as the Ranger is, it's still very useful to slow monsters down, and a Ranger certainly has quite a few tools to do this. If you're prepared to get up close and personal, we have a skill called Electrocuting Rod. First jump over the enemy and shoot it into them. Once the rod's in place, any lightning damage they take will build up a special Electrocute Gauge. Once the gauge is full, the monster is totally suppressed, allowing you to kill them easily. Okay. 
Now, sometimes when you use electrocuting rod, the enemy dies before you get a chance to electrocute them. I think there's another support gem I could add to my lightning arrow to fix this problem. Neural overload will make it easier to electrocute enemies. If the skill it's attached to puts them over 50% of their electrocute bar, it will trigger instantly. I'm not too inspired to play a ranger. I guess like moving while shooting is now, this skill works pretty really big, well for but a single large enemy. But I'd like to improve my crowd control ability for groups as well. About it, I'm right. going to add a support gem called Frozen Nexus to my Frost Escape. This makes an area of chilled ground around frozen enemies. I'll also add Deep Freeze to it as well, which will make the freezes last a bit longer. Only minion classes? Now, I mean, when POE2 comes out, we're definitely going to try enemy, to focus on minion others classes. Others nearby are slowed down. It would also be good if I had a way to slow enemies down when they're farther away from me as well. So this would be a great time to start getting into the ranger's poison and plant-based skill set. To start with, let's have a look at Vine Arrow. Plant-based skill skills. fires an arrow into the air that creates a small plant where it lands. The plant okay, sends fine. out tendrils to nearby fine. enemies, slowing them down and We're making them. a vegan ranger, guys. But it does have another function too. If the plant gets further poisoned, it transfers that poison to the monsters it's attached to. Normally you would only be able to get one vegan stack of poison on a monster drill. at a time. But you can put as much poison as you want on this plant. You could just use the plant to slow monsters down and not worry about the poison part. But if you want to go all in on poison, this is the way to do it. Now if you do want to focus on poisons more, another useful skill is Poison Bloom Arrow. This skill creates these plant pustules on the ground. If you wait a little while, they'll explode. Just like any other plant skill, these plants respond well to poison. Shoot the poison burst arrow at enemies nearby and watch your plants grow more and more powerful. Poisoning the pustules causes them to do much more damage and makes them explode much faster as well. I can also add the pierce support okay. to poison burst arrow. Doing this will mean I get multiple poison bursts as it goes through each monster. Nudge the table, sorry guys. I'm a bit more comfy now. All right, where's the Legolas skill? I don't skill remember make a nice Legolas hitting plants, plants with poison. Gas I don't remember that. Arrow. This skill shoots the ground and creates a cloud of gas that continuously poisons things inside it. Like poison arrow, your I guess. plants down, they put a gas cloud on top. The constant poisoning will make them grow. I gotta say, I like the plants mechanic, but it, it it's it's not very Legolas like. Another poison related skill we have on the Ranger is called Plague Bearer. This is a reservation skill, meaning it uses spirit. When I enable it, I get this counter that counts up whenever I apply poison to a monster. You can this see the like counter on the skill one. increasing as each new monster is poisoned. Now I'm going to fight these monsters and make sure to poison them as much as I can to build up the counter. WASD. It does take quite a while to get the counter up to 100%. I don't think I'd use it, but, but I'll give it a try, I guess. Whenever I choose, I can unleash the poison and a big explosion around my character, dealing a large amount of damage. Do they backtrack that left mouse click instant skill thing? Now next I'm up we have a fully hoping they will. rain of arrows. It's simple. Shoot a bunch of arrows in the sky and they rain down for a short time. It's decent AoE and damage at long range. Now this skill doesn't last too long, oh, yeah. but we can change mm -hmm. that. It's time to introduce frenzy charges. Frenzy charges are used for a variety of skills on the Ranger, but with Rain of Arrows they can be used to extend the duration. How do we get some though? Here we have a skill called Sniper's Mark. Put it on an enemy and it will grant you a Frenzy Charge when you crit them. Now remember that Snipe skill from earlier? That skill guarantees a critical hit. So first we Sniper's Marked an enemy, then we Sniped them. And after that the next Rain of Arrows will last a really, really long time. Sure. We still have some weaknesses though. While Rain of Arrows hits enemies with a ton of arrows, each one doesn't do much damage individually. 
It would be nice if we had a way to break the armor on enemies so that rain arrows dealt more damage. Plants. Thankfully, we have this corrode armor support gem, and we can put it on our gas cloud arrow. Corrode armor causes poison to erode the armor on targets until it's all gone. This will significantly increase the damage that Rain of Arrows does against armored targets. Oh yeah, and one more thing about gas clouds. They can be detonated with explosions. I have an explosive arrow here. Let's check it out. Armor is just physical, right? Now, because monsters and gas clouds are likely to have their armor broken, I think there's another useful combo we can do. This is an exploit weakness support. This support provides extra bonus damage to targets that have their armor broken. Perfect for what we have going on here. Do I like this game speed or faster? I don't think this will be the actual so game speed for POE2. The skills we have on the I think they're, they're, they're using that just to highlight the skills and Now characters. that we've seen all these skills, let's see how well they do against a much tougher enemy. It's time to fight the boss Another of the temples, Thanos. What? Tarvis curse madness never ends. Only is Oh, Thanos. Okay. Look, Disney's already made their call to their lawyers. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think it's too late. No, it's P H A N O S. And he is going over. Long as doesn't have a fun split. We are safe. I mean, okay, line of sight. Here. Public domain? Thanos being public domain? I don't think so. Public domain stuff is like a long time usually. I don't think Disney's letting that IP lapse. without trademark renewal? I have no idea. And that's the ranger. But oh yeah, there was one more thing. The ah. mount. Check this out. Right. Yes, you can ride a rower. While riding the rower, you can shoot arrows with no movement penalty. It's pretty overpowered. You can also use your vaulting skills to jump right off the rower's back. Once the rower doesn't have a rider, it starts attacking monsters. So he's nice to have around, even if you're not riding him. That said, if you are riding, don't get hit. If you take a heavy stun while on a rower, you'll fall off, and it takes a while to get up. So be careful. <laughs> so that's what we wanted to show you today. Now there is just one more round of positive news. Path of Exile what? 2's beta is going to be delayed. Oh. We previously said that we would get the beta out on June 7th. And while I think we would be able to get the game's content ready in time, we underestimated how long it would take to get gameplay polished to a standard that we're happy with. Mm. We're still going to be doing alpha testing in June, but we're going to be delaying the beta until later in the year. I don't have an exact date for you today, but it should be towards the end of the year. POE2 beta is delayed. Of XL1, of course. Now, speaking of POE1, you hear that? we also have the 324 expansion to announce. Oh, they didn't say when. I'm going to hand later. over to Mark, the game director on POE1, to show us what's in store. 20, later in 2024. We had a lot of fun making this one. 
So let's just get straight into it with the trailer for Path of Exile. It's Exam Blizzard that has the soon TM, so it's it's a little different, but I'm gonna dry your hair to protest. Okay. Cold flesh, dirt, maggots, and ghosts. And loot. Our job is to keep them where they belong. A what? It's your first night. We pay to get in the bed early. I don't know. I don't think so. A ghostly lantern for ghastly tinkering. What is this? Do so you have like negative mods and you attribute them to certain bosses? You learn to peer into the souls of the dead. You learn how to twist them. Sure. Meet me in the necropolis. You can pilfer shiny things from a corpse, but you can pilfer glorious things from a soul. I need a grave digger. Oh, what? Multiple Atlas trees? What does that mean? Like deleting our instant skills. We have more transfigured gems should be pretty pog. It does put like an asterisk on, on the patch notes. The job's hard, but the pay's good. What do you say? It's In the Necropolis one. League, you will encounter Undertaker Aramor, a man collecting the scattered spirits of the Eternal Empire for a mysterious purpose. These spirits have begun to haunt the monsters of Rayclast, unleashing their ancient fury and sorrow onto the world. So random the monsters Undertaker will provide you with the Lantern of Aramor, a powerful family heirloom which can illuminate the wrathful spirits haunting monsters throughout Rayclast. With it, the Undertaker hopes to employ you to rid Rayclast of this menace. I mean, those look like they died. Cause. Those look like they died at the same time. So I guess the you're just farming the resource. The when entering any new area. When peering through it, you can examine the spirits haunting that area. The Lantern also allows you to manipulate them, letting you configure which monsters are affected by which mobs. It would be wise to take your time with your decisions here, for the spirits are not forgiving. When peering through the lantern, you can also see extra details about the packs of monsters in the area. Rowers here are considered common, whereas the water elementals are more scarce. If you want things to be easier, you can put the more difficult spirits on the elementals, which you'll encounter less often. Mm. We've tried to make sure that by engaging with the lantern, you are able to intelligently control the it's difficulty. It's interesting that you have that information. The spirits come in a number of forms which represent the danger they pose. For example here, the infested vultures are servant haunted, causing them to deal a small amount of increased damage. But the vols vanguard are noble haunted, causing them to deal a large amount of increased damage. As you reach higher level areas in Rayclast, the tear and number of spirits that are haunting monsters will generally increase. Your game knowledge can help you here. If you're aware of the composition of a monster pack, this means certain mods will be easier to manage. For example, the mod that increases a pack's Edamorph damage for every monster mod. killed has no effect on packs with a single monster, like a devourer. However, if we found a spirit that makes the strongest monster in a pack deal 100% more damage, well, I'm going to avoid the Devourer. You might have noticed that the Lantern of Aramor provides other useful information, such as the types of abilities monsters use, or the damage types they deal. But you're still so just farming souls. For those who are less familiar with how these monsters work, or are they also this dropping be a great more to learn what you're up against. The spirits are constantly moving throughout Rayclast, so if you are finding a campaign area too difficult, you can just wait a few minutes and peer through the lantern again to see what's changed. Nope. Of course, powerful Not spirits beget powerful rewards. There are two reasons why you might want to face a challenge now and then. Firstly, 
Not all the spirits are malicious. Sometimes the monsters aren't haunted at all, but are instead devoted. These can grant basic rewards like increased experience, or bigger rewards like spawning the Nameless Seer, an NPC that will grant you a single unique item after you defeat all of the packs affected by that spirit. Okay, the more that's haunted pretty cool. monsters you defeat in the previous area before using the lantern, the more likely the devoted monsters will appear in the next area. Monsters haunted by higher tier spirits will increase the chance of the devoted appearing even more, meaning that sometimes it's worth putting the hardest modifier possible on very common monsters, if you're brave enough. Again, we've tried hard here to allow players to customize the danger and reward. And the as much tuning as they can. is so important on this. Or Aramor really, is an see. undertaker. And you can probably guess what we're taking to him. The second main reward from the Necropolis League is monsters with unresolved anguish. Once slain, their corpses need extra care from the Undertaker, and he will offer to take them back to his Necropolis and store them in the morgue. Time to earn your keep. When you are ready, you can visit the morgue to view the monsters you have collected, and mm -hmm. then get to work burying them in one of many graves in Aramor Cemetery. For example, we will bury this Katava's Herald. Why are we Aramor's doing mysterious that? mysterious soul experiments can coalesce powerful items. Here I've chosen to create a pair of boots. God, this is just going to be like a white These pair of boots. These are useful in, in for ruthless. my character, but aren't exactly what I hope for. Yeah, they, and this okay. is where the Necropolis Kinda crafting suck. system really shines. You'll have noticed that the corpse we collected earlier had a crafting effect on it. In fact, all collected corpses do. If you bury multiple corpses in the cemetery, all adjacent corpses can be exercised at once to create one item. All of the crafting effects on those corpses will apply to that same item. This allows you to have either one or many different crafting projects ongoing in the cemetery. For example, next time okay. I try to create boots, I could bury corpses that increase the chance of getting move speed modifiers. To go further, I could use these to generate higher tier modifiers. Then I could try to bias it towards being an evasion. What is tier plus 100 this. tier rating? What the hell is that? Finally, I'll apply some crafting effects that improve the probability of getting good rolls. Now, let's craft our item and see what we get. He's supposed to kill all those monsters, right? Oh, no, he doesn't. As you can see now, we have a much better pair of boots, forged from the souls of our enemies. Still a terrible item type, though. You could though. even use the entire cemetery to craft one item. There is always something you can do to try and ensure your item will be as best as it can be. We hope to see some really crazy grave crafts. If you are lucky, know, that you was, might find corpses with that was an incursion item. Right? I'm not an incursion. These can be buried to manipulate your crafting it. projects in more drastic ways. This one increases the potency of all crafting effects of adjacent undead corpses. Another meta crafting modifier gives a chance to drop an extra item from your craft, with all the same crafting outcomes applied. All you have to do is bury a lot of undead monsters. Okay. I mean, this might actually be pretty decent for Ruthless. You can also craft new unique items exclusive to the Necropolis League using this system. As you explore Rayclast, you might find the corpses of famous Eternal Empire families. And when you bury an entire family together and exorcise them, they will thank you with a unique specific to their lineage. I hope this is not like collecting McDonald's tax. Monopoly tickets. I'll give you a moment to check that out. You can use other corpses alongside them to grant implicit mods, manipulate the values of explicit mods, and more. In this case, with the Parandus Pact, you can even change the modifiers it generates. This unique Good. is a jewel which adds extra stats to passive skills in a radius when socketed into the passive skill tree. The stats it adds are randomly generated, but you can bias it towards a specific type by using other crafting effects, such as this one, which increases the chance of getting life modifiers. 
Let's see what we get. Damn, we didn't get it this time. I guess we're going to have to go and collect more corpses. Does he want of the course, life one? you can trade the corpses away to other players. All you need to do is purchase empty coffins from the Undertaker and use them on your corpses in the morgue, which will itemize them. Wait. Another item in the Necropolis League that you can find are Embers of the All Flame. These are monster spirits that remain living in the All Flame, a powerful ancient artifact of Rayclast. And you can set them free by placing them in the Lantern of Aramor and defeating them. These embers drop throughout Rayclast as itemized packs of monsters. You are able to use these packs to replace the packs in areas. For example, we have found this All Flame Ember of Tarfor. We can now go to enter the next area and replace one of the monster packs in here. You can see we have also gotten one of Trade the League. devoted modifiers nah, to appear. I've, I've kind of learned my lesson last the season. Ancestors with it's this ruthless modifier, for life. Making them even more rewarding. Let's go ahead and replace the tentacle miscreations. However, when replacing packs, you want to double check their density, as the new pack will inherit the density of the replaced pack. The Karui ancestors we have now added to our area can even drop basic variations of tattoos. If you aren't aware, this is an item type from the Trial of the Ancestors Wait. League, which can what? be used on passive skills to change what they do. There are many different types of itemized packs. You can find Breach and Legion monsters that drop splinters, untainted packs that provide insane amounts of so experience, these are just dropped? and even simple frogs, which can be used to replace difficult monsters to I make tattoos. life easier. I want tats. And of course, these Ember monsters can be raised as specters too. Finally, probably suck, let's okay, discuss how maybe. this league works in in-game maps. Each in-game map will allow you to manipulate it using the lantern on the map device UI. However, instead of randomly cycling every few minutes, it is fixed to that map. Once you view the map through the lantern, you cannot remove it from the map device, so you can't trade that map away now that you've seen it is too difficult for you, or has monsters in it that you'd rather avoid, like porcupines. We're also trying something new this time around. During the Necropolis League, there will be support for the League on the Atlas Passive Tree. Multiple clusters will be there, allowing you to enhance the gameplay, customize it, and even change its behavior in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. One way that you can change the crafting in a meaningful way is with the Prospero's Wager Keystone. With this keystone, all the monsters with unresolved anguish come with this crafting modifier, which causes them to generate a random craft when buried. This means instead of pre-planning your crafts, you have to adapt to them on the fly to get the best results. These clusters will not be available in Standard League. In 324, we've made a plethora of changes to what? the endgame. We've introducing new bosses, adding another tier of maps, good? and That's streamlining the Atlas. What? The most That's difficult like and most rewarding rare, content basically. in Path of Exile can be found in Uber Pinnacle bosses, such as the Maven and the Searing Exarch. Currently, the only way to access these bosses is by allocating specific keystones on the Atlas Passive Tree. While this system offers a nice element of control, it causes a problem. Rewards and access to the non-Uber variants are now economically priced around the rewards of the Uber fights. This means it is wasteful to run the non-Uber variants instead of simply selling them. Mm -hmm. Another problem that we noticed is the difficulty jump between the Pinnacle and Uber Pinnacle content was relatively large and there wasn't obvious yeah, content that could bridge this gap. Many players would give up on their characters before being able to defeat the Uber Pinnacle bosses. Or like, why In bother? In 324, we will be making some changes to this. We are removing the keystones that give Can access to the that? Uber no. Pinnacle bosses from the Atlas Tree, and instead we'll be adding a new set of fragments that give you access to this content. Where do I you just get can't hear fragments? it very well. We are adding a new tier of maps, Tier 17 Maps which not uh. only give you access to the Uber Pinnacle content, but also test your characters in new ways. They feature a new set of bosses, Uber monsters, and a new tier of modifiers that can roll on the maps. There are five new tier 17 maps in total, with some surprising boss fights at the end. We'll look at a couple today, and the rest you'll have to discover for yourself. First, we have the Citadel map. This map contains an ancient Kalgurin citadel. 
you will encounter many expedition monsters as the signature packs throughout the map. At the end, you will fight Uber Utrud. Oh this is no! A version of a boss from Expedition League. A boss with all is its abilities horrible. and mechanics enhanced. Uber Utrud will even be able to summon two other Expedition bosses to aid it during the. If fight. you think you don't hate this boss, you will. Secondly, we have the Fortress map. This map is an impregnable fortress, guarded by monsters from the Heist League. I think At this one's end, actually pretty good. You will encounter an Uber version of the Unbreakable. Again, it has enhanced abilities and mechanics you'll have to learn and overcome. Each of the tier 17 map bosses has a chance to drop a unique item, allowing for some target farming. However, these aren't entirely new unique items. Instead, we've taken other unique items, removing them from the core drop pool, and rebalancing them to fit here. One example is this reworked version of Wraith Lord. It has four abyss sockets, and allows you to summon an additional spectre for each ghastly eye jewel socketed into it. Wow. Another example is Mana Storm. This has been rebalanced to grant a lot more damage than before, alongside some more impactful mana stats. If you can get lucky rolls. Alongside adding tier 17 maps, we have also changed the uber pinnacle bosses to have completely distinct unique item drop pools from their non-uber counterparts. This means there is a reason to farm both versions. Let's take a look at the shaper versus the uber shaper. The Shaper will drop these uniques. Voidwalker, Shaper's Touch, Solstice Vigil, and Dying Sun. Does he do that the already? The Shaper will drop these. Echoes of Creation, Sublime Vision, Entropic Devastation, Starforge, and a new unique belt called the Tides of Time. Another example of a new unique is this helmet from the Uber Eater of Worlds, Ravenous Passion. And these gloves from the Uber Searing Exarch, the Celestial Brace. Each of the Uber Pinnacle bosses has that a can be pretty good. added to their drop pools. We have identified another major problem with the endgame we'd like to address. With every expansion added to the game, we have been increasing the complexity of running maps. It's at the point now where a player must repeatedly execute a large sequence of steps to run maps efficiently. It can be easy to forget critical steps, and it can be tiring to repeat them. To solve this, we are removing some systems, but are keeping what is good about them. The two what? main systems we've removed are Sextants and the Master Mission Selector. It is not our intention to dull the content, however. We have hmm. completely reworked Scarabs to include most of the options that were previously covered by those mechanics. And oh, many, how does that work in Ruthless, though? Let's take a look at some of them. Commonly, you might find scarabs that simply grant access to different content. Here, we have a scarab that causes beyond demons to spawn when killing monsters in your maps. And here, we have one that adds a delirium mirror. Each type of scarab now has multiple versions, so if you want to fully invest in a type of content, you can do so. Here's a suite of ultimatum scarabs. This ultimatum scarab adds an ultimatum encounter to a map. That makes this it worse. ultimatum scarab of bribing then causes that ultimatum encounter to grant better rewards and its monsters to yield more experience. Probably still this worse. This ultimatum scarab of dueling will cause that ultimatum encounter to always guarantee the trial master boss fight at the end, assuming you can survive through mm. all the rounds. Mm. This ultimatum scarab of catalyzing will cause all rewards from that ultimatum to be catalysts instead of other rewards. And finally, this ultimatum scarab of inscription will cause all catalyst rewards from that ultimatum to be inscribed ultimatums instead. There are plenty of others. If you enjoy divination card farming, you might want to use these. This divination scarab of curation causes more divination cards to drop for each different favored map you have selected. Oh, that's cool. But it also causes whatever map you're running to only drop divination cards from those favored maps. So if you want to try and aim for your mage blood and don't want to just farm Crimson Temple, then this scarab is for you. This divination scarab of mm. completion causes your divination People are gonna break to have that a 20% sure. chance to drop as a full stack instead for maximum dopamine. Basically, oh, there works. are now just a lot of scarabs. You might have also noticed that they no longer have tears. Scarabs are now all world drops. You can get them anywhere. Some might be rarer than others, but the intention is that there'll be a lot more options than before. How do Kirak and missions more interesting work? combinations to consider. If you want to target specific scarabs, Betrayal has been updated to include most of them, and you will need to relearn which ones come from where. 
While this system is allowing you to heavily invest in one type of content, it is reducing your capacity for variety. To address this, we have massively increased access to content on the Atlas Passive Tree. You are now able to reliably get different leagues like Breach or Legion from just your Atlas Passives. Regarding Master Missions, See? content such as Incursion, Delve, Betrayal and Bestiary, these two are now accessible with Scarabs and have more reliable investment options on the tree. Not only this, you can now get Jun, Einhar, Alva and Nico to appear together in the same map. We have also removed some keystones such as Wandering Path, Grand Design and Growing Hordes, but have added some new ones too. For example, Unwavering Vision, Back yeah, to basics. Pretty good. And thorough exploration. I mean, I, I love and the shakeups. And we have added some new notables, such as remarkable relics, which allows you to try find better variants of scarabs. Mounting modifiers, which increases the values of modifiers on your maps by two percent for each explicit modifier, and tainted carapaces which is just one in a set of many that allow you to target farm specific types of scarabs. These are just a few of the many new notables that can be found on the Atlas Passive skill tree. Lastly, we are giving you more There's flexibility so many mechanics, in what right? content you want to run in the end game. Twice as likely in of 3. like 24, you 25 can things. Copies of the Atlas tree, which can be swapped between maps at your leisure. You can unlock up to two extra trees for a total of three by progressing through the end game and completing core content. That's pretty cool. When you open a map, you can select which tree you would like to use. Uh, uh. For a given league, you'll never feel constrained to playing your endgame a single way. You can also label your trees to easily identify which one has which content. With all this combined, we're hoping to see new endgame strategies shine through. I think you'll definitely While see that. While playing through the campaign in 324, you'll notice a myriad of small improvements and surprises. The fundamentals of the campaign are still intact, but we've scattered fun encounters and secrets throughout Rayclast. The Dweller of the Deep has been trapped. What are these ritual shrines doing in the Northern Forest? Oh, he's in Essence Mark. And why are they giving me omens? This device looks safe. I should definitely use this on my items. There are plenty more encounters to discover. We'll continue adding more surprises in future releases, mm -hmm. so keep an eye out. In the previous expansion, 323, we released a large number of transfigured skill gems. Mostly These for are int. alternate versions of existing skill gems that function in very different ways, Give us allowing the for more gems. build and gameplay variety. Strength gems. At the time, our aspirations were higher than we could achieve. We planned more gems than we could make. So, in 324, we're adding another set of transfigured gems that we have now finished. Strength gems. High shot, incinerate, artillery ballista, Eight. tornado, elemental hit, kinetic blast, poisonous concoction, and lastly, summon holy relic. Uh, Hopefully those of you who missed your yeah. favorite skill having a transfigured variant will get that here. We will certainly be adding more of these in the future. Especially That's... for skills that are missing them still. many of them. Of course, we'll also be doing a balance pass on the existing transfigured gems. They're nerfing Penance brand. One of the main ones we're looking at is Henetic Bolt of Fragmentation. As a result of this change, it is clear that the endgame potential of the Wanda archetype really starts to suffer, mostly in the single target damage department. Due to this, we've added the new support gem, Sacred Wisps. This support gem causes supported skills to create two attached wisps for a duration. With these wisps, whenever you attack, they have a chance to also use the same skill, if you have enemies in your presence. And if there are any rare or unique enemies, they will always use the skill. Are they minions? That leads us into all the other quality of life features we're introducing in 324. That's, that's, the, that's the only thing I need to know. Are the wisps Many of these minions? have been revealed in teasers already, but here's a quick summary. We've added the automation and call to arms skill gems for being able to trigger instant skills and war cries without this having to buy good. them to left click. Very bad. You can now hold down control and left click to automatically apply certain currency orbs until they achieve the desired result, or you run out. For example, you can hold down fusings until you reach maximum links. 
Oh, I see. You just hold down You will down be able button. to control, shift, click currency into a trade window to automatically move all of that currency at once from your inventory. Uh, sure. Whatever. Okay. Detonate dead now has clearer telegraphing effects. When harvest crafting, uh, the item okay. hover will always be visible, so you no longer have to mouse back and forth to see the results of your crafts. When you use a Val Orb on a map, the map no longer has a chance to become unidentified. Instead, it adds a new implicit. Best. We've created a set of implicits that affect the areas in fun ways. Related to that, corrupted and mirrored items can now be identified. Breach hands now open upon approach, and no longer need to be clicked. Thank God. Upgrades to Pantheon powers now apply to all characters in a league. You no longer need to grind divine What's vessels Pantheon? on each new character. I never heard of this. With harvest crafting, you Literally can now re-roll Uber player. Elder Fragments. Fragments dropped by the Shaper cannot be re-rolled into fragments dropped by the Elder, and vice versa. Regarding Betrayal, we're removing Ashling's crafting bench as a reward. Instead, Veiled Orbs now perform that function. They remove a mod and replace it with a Veiled mod. I think it still won't These be These orbs now drop oh. from Katarina and are no longer a world drop. Yeah. Flasks can now be corrupted by Val Orbs, giving random minus 10 to plus 10 quality. The capability to add extra quality to weapons, armors, and flasks has been removed from Betrayal. Oh. The betrayal bench craft that converts an amulet to a talisman has been moved to bestiary, and thus can be traded. Maven invitations no longer drop. Instead, when you have completed witnessing all bosses required to go to the Maven's arena, you can just talk to Kerak, and he'll open a map device window with the invitation already in there, ready to be rolled. Valdo's maps that granted rolled. invitations now give scarabs. No more having to waste guardian kills to try get invitations to drop. That's pretty big, actually. Next up, we're going to be talking about our new League supporter packs. I mean, I'll just Today, buy one, whatever. we're launching two new series of supporter packs, the Solar and Eldritch packs. Each tier contains the full pack's face value and points, alongside several exclusive microtransactions. Why don't they show them? These packs are only available for the duration of the Hell? Necropolis League, and will leave the store forever when it ends. Just show it. As always, the microtransactions in these packs are purely cosmetic, and do not affect your character's power or progression in any way. The Solar oh, okay. series of supporter packs contains six exclusive microtransactions. The Cosmos Weapon Effect adorns your weapon with stars. Hitting enemies causes cosmic energy to spill out into the area around them. Oh man, that's the gonna be a little bit too much. The Radiant Orb of Chance Extra Effect projects the outcome of items you've used an Orb of Chance on above your head. Remember to congratulate other exiles in town if you see them chance a powerful, unique item. Shine boldly with yeah. the Solar Knight armor set. The power of the sun radiates from your body, getting more and more intense as you use skills and emitting solar flares as you run. With Just the supernova like a little level bit up too extra much. effect, the dead will be raised from the distracting. ground around you before being obliterated and turned to ash by an epic supernova whenever you level up. What? This one is my personal favorite. The Cosmic Turtle Hideout lets you travel the infinite expanse of the cosmos atop the back of a colossal turtle. Oh, that's sweet. Carry the weight of the sun on your back with the Solar Guardian back attachment. Witness it grow larger and larger as the energy of slain enemies is funneled into it. When it reaches its maximum size, it goes supernova and turns into a black hole, forever drifting throughout Rayclast. The Eldritch Pack series Forever. also has six exclusive microtransactions. Are you wondering if we moved the stash in the latest patch? Don't be fooled, because with the Mimic Stash Pet, players can transform into an image of a stash when in a town or hideout, and scare unsuspecting exiles. This pet follows behind you with its terrifying hand walking the rest of the time. The Shaper's Slam Finisher effect sends slain unique enemies into a final abyss of unending darkness. The Eldritch Hunger armor set contains a beast that demands you to feed it by embracing your bloodlust. Watch it grow in power the more you kill until it bursts from the shell of the helmet. Are you able to satiate its hunger? The seed within the Corrupted Growth map device expands its grasp on your hideout the more maps you complete on your atlas. Equipping That's the Headhunter cool. character effect causes skulls of slain rare enemies to whirl around you like trophies. 
They become enraged when you are near a rare enemy you are yet to kill, wishing for them to join your collection. Witness a reality where the struggle didn't exist, allowing the Eldritch Horrors to settle their own conflicts with the Eldritch Horror Apparition Effect. Which of the Eater of Worlds or Searing Exarch do you think will win? These packs are now available for purchase on both PC and console, and will remain so during Path of Exile Necropolis. Meanwhile, the Shade and Disciple packs leave the store forever at the launch of Necropolis League, so now's your last chance to purchase them. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. We're just about to start the Q&A with Ziggy D. Afterwards, we'll post Path of Exile Necropolis's full patch notes. Afterwards. With release at the end of next week, our community team will be posting crucial Take information like you'll need for Necropolis's release. Keep an eye on the news. On release weekend, we expect to launch the new mystery box and this season's character was pretty cool. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today and checking out our latest developments. We're looking forward to doing some awesome Gravecrafts and conquering the new in-game bosses with you next week. We'll begin the Q&A shortly, so please get your questions ready. I have posted my questions in Ziggy's chat for this thing. I kind of stopped bothering like a couple years ago, but I did it for like, I don't know, a good six or seven streams in a row, and you never picked my question. Yeah, they never picked my... What, what the hell? Well, there's a lot of people that ask questions, to be fair. Well, that was pretty interesting. Um... Good morning, Exiles, and welcome to our Q&A portion for today. I'm joined by Jonathan and Mark. And first thing, we're going to be talking about Path of Exile 1 questions. As I know that's the content that you'll be getting your hands on soon and want to hear all about. And then afterwards, we'll follow up with a bit of a deep dive into Path of Exile 2 reveals, both from today and also some of the other stuff that came up. So I think Mark does on a lot of POE but, uh, 1 stuff, morning, but I think Jonathan I does everyone. mostly hey, POE 2 stuff. Nice to be here again. Yeah, good morning. <clears throat> Thanks for having us. <laughs> Always a pleasure. I love talking to you folks about Path of Exile, right? So let's <laughs> kick things off with the new League Necropolis. And I just want to ask, should I ask about Lycia and Katarina and what it means for them to be involved, especially since they like characters that are actively present elsewhere in the game in another mechanic right now? Like, what does that mean? Um, uh, we, we bent the rules a little bit on that teaser. They're not actually involved. <laughs> um, they're o only in the sense that they are both... Uh, T17 map bosses, so you don't actually fight them together, but uh, we thought it would make a cool, uh, you know, little teaser shot there, and I, I think it did. It raised a lot of questions, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay. I was like, we're just doing some timing wimey stuff. Oh, they both kind of, like, deal with death, so there's a bit of a connection. T17 well, well, bosses maps, should be quite a lot stronger. And the line gets a bit blurred. You can kind of do whatever you want, which is a, a good thing about that system. You don't have to stay so grounded. And Especially the stuff, maps but, have modifiers on um, them. So, yeah, we do have some interesting encounters going on there that are a bit different, um, but, you know, it's, again, the, the maps allow us to... Uh, kind of detach from the the groundedness of the world and the rules of what's actually happening in there, happening in there. It looks like there's a lot of boss stuff coming this league. Is that all focused in the new T17 maps or is there some with the league mechanic itself as well? Uh no, we focus the monster development this time. Around. All right. That's fine. I'll just talk over them a bit. Uh but yeah, for for Ruthless, it is pretty interesting. Um I think the new league is mostly going to pop out just rare items. Um, so you might get, like, good rare items, but I don't know if you'll get, like, rare items that are, like, that good. You know, like, the rare items people got really excited about, like, before, they were, like, crazy modified. They were, like, things that would be strictly only crafted just about. Right? So, but I think that part is, like, really good for Ruthless. Um, Ruthless might be way harder if they remove, like, Kirok stuff. Like, they talked about the other masters having, like, itemized scarabs instead of missions. And, I mean, before you had, like, the node where you'd get more missions every day. So there's probably something similar to get, like, way more scarabs for the guys. But, but Kirok, like, that's, like, different dailies, right? Those are like really different dailies, so I'm not sure how they'll incorporate that because the Kirok missions are like absolutely huge for map completion in Ruthless, so I have to see. Details really matter on that. 
as GGG. Cool content. Oh. Uh, not really sure. I mean, they have a really good core core in, in their game structure, which I think goes a really long way. Because when they do an update, they don't have to do that much stuff. Um, for transfigured gems, we had a ton of transfigured gems last last patch. Like a ton. Way more than like the five they said that we're getting in this one. But in this one, we're getting Holy Relic, which is pretty interesting. Now, one thing that they didn't really mention is if we're getting the like crazy specters from Wildwood in any way. Right, like that's that's a pretty important thing. So uh, we'll have to see. Boat league. Generally, the most exciting things for me for a new league are like worthwhile, good, and repeatable content, and big like character or yeah passive tree shakeups. And in this case, we're getting like the Atlas shakeup and like the Atlas system shakeup. And I think Ruthless is going to have its own unique interpretation on it to further like shake that up a bit. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, PoE2 died for this. I don't think PoE2 died for this. They said they, they wanted more time to polish their uh, gameplay or something. Something of that sort. Um, well, like I played, I played at ExileCon. I played like... Not only I played Monk, but I played like at least a little bit of each of the classes. And uh, like most of them played pretty well, except for I think the class was Warrior. So the Warrior had like extremely slow attacks. Like we're talking about 0.5 attacks per second. Like it would take two seconds to execute a melee attack. And, um, I mean, it's, it wasn't even like they did that much damage. So, yeah. Uh, it might be a case where there's just a few, like, holes that they kind of got to do over again. Yeah. So, uh, there, there might be a little bit of that. Let's just see what they're saying real quick. Discrepancy between just running regular T16s and obviously top tier juicing, you end up with like you know the multiplier difference of the amount of t16s dropping is uh substantial to say the least <laughs> and we didn't want it to be that uh we have to balance around the juicing uh with respect to getting t17s we wanted to be that more accessible across the board um and so uh yes we added a kind of diminishing return so uh, like your first one might be quite probable the next one's less and the next one less and then you're not going to get like you know 20 t17s in one map kind of thing going on Right. Um, it is also worth noting T17s cannot drop T17s. They are not self-sustaining. The mm. intention is that you are still kind of doing T16s and occasionally diving into T17s, unless you want to trade, of course, in which case, you know, the world's your oyster. So I saw they have a their own new mod pool, um, and we saw things, one of the mods I saw was uh, Ray Monsters removed 10% of life, mana, and ES on hit. The mana removed on hit seems to break a lot of builds in particular whenever that sort of thing comes up. Uh, as mana is generally a pretty finely tuned system in Path of Exile. And it gets me thinking in general about mods like 80% reduced recovery and things that disable auras and stuff like that. And it feels just a bit not too dissimilar to monsters just being immune to your build, right? Um, so what's the intention behind those sorts of modifiers in maps? Are they going to uh, remove your auras? I don't think so. It was the ideal dream back when that there are a lot of modifiers that can't be done by every build and you'd re-roll them and whatnot now obviously in the context of t17s you can't re-roll them so this really is you can't re -roll um them. you should either change your play style take your time be a bit more careful um to do it or you can trade it away of course or maybe you simply can't run it on that character and you have to maybe build a different character that is capable of doing or more characters that are capable of doing different maps um there is one tool though that is in the form of a scarab um, one of the scarabs gives you additional crafting modifiers on your map device. It isn't a common scarab by any means, so you can't just use it on every T17. But two of the extra crafting mods that get applied to the map device is that prefixes are disabled and suffixes are disabled. So you can pick one of those. 
So if you do get one of these T17s, I do expect sometimes, and you're like, ah, I can't run it because of this modifier. You can at least use that scarab to turn that off occasionally. Um, so it is like one of the tools <laughs> that you can use to uh, get around certain mods that it might be too hard or you can't quite get through. But the general idea is that you do have to actually think about these modifiers, play around them, change your characters. It's not to just a kind of like, well, you don't have to elk them. They drop roll, yeah, but it shouldn't have to just see be a T17 is mindless, mindless go in there and do it. Unless, of course, your build is so strong and so diverse that it can do that, which that's fine. If you want to build your character that way, then Astronauts you know that's win. what the game allows you to do, and that's what we like. So, Right on, right on. We'll uh, jump back to the league a little bit before we uh, move on to some of the other end game questions that I have. Uh, but uh, what you're doing with the difficulty control for Necropolis, where you can select which monsters get buffed in which ways, seems like a lot of what people have been asking for, especially with Afflictions launch, where we didn't have as precise control over the difficulty of content we were facing. That said, how do you weigh up giving this level of control against things like adding to the time it takes to jump into the gameplay? Yeah, they did that me. This is going to take a bit of time to like read through those things and shuffle the menu each time. Um, so obviously we like giving control. Um, but yes, in this league, you cannot skip the difficulty. Um, mm. Having the control is a way to make it easier or harder, if you want. Uh, yeah, how long does Q&A run? It's usually like an hour. Yeah, hopefully you get as many good ones as you can. But also the other thing, just while we're on that topic, of the other reason why it's actually sometimes good to make things harder um, in some sense. Uh, there's so many axes here that it's, it's, it's <laughs> more like you want as many monsters as possible haunted by as many high tier things as possible. Um, is that the haunted monsters are the ones that can turn into the ones that you collect for crafting. So again, if you want to maximize your crafting output, mm. you want to be putting the haunted modifiers of the highest tiers on the most, the, uh, the packs that have the highest density and pack size. Um, so again, going into mud flats as the example, you want to have the rollers do that if you want to maximize your crafting output. So there are two axes and I, I did get for that why from the you trailer. want to be making things harder. But often what I will, I would say people are probably going to be like, I'm going to make things a bit easier to start with as and they get more comfortable with their character as their character gets more powerful. They start to take a little bit more risks in that regard. And of course, if it becomes too hard and they over, over make it too hard for themselves, um, the mods rotate pretty frequently, like to the point of you like running through an area, the next time you, if you then had to recreate that area, um, because you're like, nah, this is, I've made it too hard. Um, the mods will be ro have rotated and you can adapt your decisions and be like, yeah, this is easier for me now. I'll, I'll, I'll wait a few more areas or some more but levels until I then raise the difficulty. My internet's supposed to be good here. So I guess how it's still clearly is that like reward system communicated in the UI? Can like someone who hasn't like watched this know that, you know, killing more of these monsters will give more devoted to the next zone and stuff like that? Uh, that isn't currently communicated, but it will be. Um, you okay. probably didn't see it in the live stream, but we will do that. Um, at least on the hovers, when you hover over and it just says devoted, yep. we will put like a little, um, you know, like, well, we'll put it on the hovers of all the like tier things where it says like, you know, servant haunted, noble haunted, etc. Um, currently I think it says something, but I can't remember what, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do a, um, uh, you know, a pass on making things more observable and all of that. It's actually kind of interesting on that point um, that uh, this is the first time in P. I think I am going to call it. Uh, we're going to be waiting for patch notes like an hour plus. So I think I'm going to go chill. Maybe I'll check out the patch notes a bit if I'm still up. But um, if not, maybe I'll cover it on a stream. Probably will stream at least uh, once more while we're here. And we will get back in time some BGs and we'll get back in time for the action with the league. Um, I think regardless of the changes that they make, I'm going to end up playing root no matter what. They did try to play normal this time around to start and it was fun for like a few days, but then the crazy abundance really was bothersome, I would say. So I'm already pretty committed to playing root this time around. Just 